All right, now for our last uh, actual talk, our last actual presentation uh, of the weekend, uh, we introduce you to uh, Mr. Johan Dept. He's an Esperantist, he's from uh, the Netherlands, and he was going to talk today about um, how to basically, how and why to incorporate various international vocabulary into auxiliary languages. And here he is, thank you very much. This is a picture of um, a theory by Abraham or Abraham de Swan. He's a Dutch uh, sociolinguist, and he invented this uh, model of the world languages system. Um, it consists of a hypercentral language, which nowadays is English and it is surrounded by uh, many other so-called super-central languages. Um, those super-central languages uh, usually are also considered as world languages, like uh, Spanish, French, uh, Russian, Hindi, uh, Japanese, etc. Um, and around those super-central languages uh, revolve central languages, which are standardized, uh, often national languages. And those central languages often borrow words from the super central languages. Um, and finally, the central, often national languages, had a great influence on peripheral languages, like Frisian, um, more manic at all. Um, this uh, sociolinguist, Abraham de Swan, stresses that um, languages interact with one another, they compete with one another, and are engaged in a power struggle. Of course, this struggle is not a planned one. Although in 1943, Winston Churchill advocated basic English as a world tongue by saying, here you had a very carefully wrought plan for an international language capable of very wide transactions of practical business and interchange of ideas. And undoubtedly, the State Department in Washington is very much interested in the significance of promoting the English language and the economic advantages for its international commerce. This unplanned struggle between languages takes several forms. Marginalizing and displacing languages up to completely devouring them. More peaceful intrusion is the so-called loaning of words. No language can escape the thrust of foreign words coming with new commodities, techniques, social methods, science, and youth culture. Although the attitude of language communities against this thrust from outside is very diverse. In Icelandic, television is called Schoenwar, and in German, Fernsehen. French is much more subject to intrusion of English words than is generally assumed. And the French government adopted strong legislation to curb the replacement of originally French words and inventing new ones, like courriel for email and logiciel for software. The model of competing languages by Bram de Schwan categorizes languages as, I said already, peripheral, central, supercentral, and hypercentral. The one hypercentral language is English. Supercentral are Arabic, Chinese, French, German, Hindi, Japanese, Malaysian, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish. National languages are most often central, while peripheral languages often are not much written and are not standardized. 
The structure of dependency of languages defines the direction in which marginaliz marginalization and loading of words takes place, top down. English lends words to German, German lends words to Turkish, Turkish lends to Kurdish, not vice versa, in general, of course. This lending of words, however, depends on the linkages people of one language have with another language. German can only loan words to Turkish because many Turks lend to German. And Kurdish uh, borrows from Turkish because Kurds lend to Turkish cities. People from different languages tend to communicate in a language to which both are linked higher in the hierarchy. So Flemish people often communicate with Walloons in English, although French has a higher status than Dutch. But those languages, French and Dutch, are not closely linked. The difficulties of this rationalized scheme are numerous, mainly because it does not include political and cultural differences <coughs> and the function of identification a language has. Think of Spanish in um, Southern America who dislike speaking English, and many, many other examples. On an individual le level, and now I have to change this, the level of symbol words or expressions, one can think of many patterns of learning. Simple borrowing from one language to another, uh, simple transfer through an inter intermediate language, so to say. Uh, Two-sided borrowing, uh, uh, a language can uh, load the word through another language, but also directly. And the last graph is just a fancy graph of how uh, a borrowing process could have occurred. Focusing now on the borrowing of a specific word, one can distinguish many factors influencing the process. For instance, um, at the middle left, no, that's clear, at the middle left, you see the source language, which exerts its influence, top center, in a certain historical period, historical event, on other languages, native languages, down left. Depending on that period, the source language has a certain extension over the world and has contact by way of the, of the available means of communication with the native language. And that is um, indicated by geographical proximity. What is now ge geographical close uh, one century ago was ge geographical not close at all. Also a factor pertaining to the intensity of communication at the right is the linguistic relationship between the source language and the native language. Finally, the borrowing process may be caused and supported by production and trading of objects or phenomena, phenomena whose names are new to the speakers of the native language. And depending on the kind of objects traded and phenomena uh, transferred, um, there will be a certain type of board which is going to be loaned to the native language. You all know from recent European history 
how words in certain economic branches were important, imported from one language, were imported from language, one language, and words for cultural activities from another. Musical terms and banking were loaned, borrowed from Italian. Cuisine and clothing fashion from French. Technical word from German. Shipbuilding occasionally from Dutch. Sports terms from English. Because all those influences follow each other, each language becomes a multi-layered structure of foreign influences. To create a model of this multipolar world, then, it is necessary to abstract from historical period. At first, I simplify the flow chart just and have this. But one powerful language, like English, lends the same words not only to one native language, but to many of them. So another diagram to account for. Yes, so another diagram to account for six languages is now this is all rather abstract and uh, it's impossible to uh, conclude anything from it. And now, what is the relevance of creating such a flow chart for the business of compliance? I don't know. Um, are there any of you who speak Edo? Oh. No Edo? Um, yes, uh, uh, Metro Dutch Ah, uh, uh, good. And maybe somebody also speaks Esperanto? Are there people who uh, know Interlingua? Yeah. yeah. Uh, separately, no. Are there more of those um, uh, uh, languages, pronouns, which uh, aspire to be spoken over the world? I don't see uh, the name. Uh, of the, of the kind. Uh, okay, uh, uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Um, if we consider the three artificial languages, Interlingua, Ido, and Esperanto, they represent, with respect to borrowing words from natural languages, a small spectrum. After World War II, Interlingua has begun to re rely for its vocabulary more and more on the great European languages. The passive understanding of Interlingua rests completely on the principle of loan words. The developers of Ido in the 20s of the last century screened many words who they thought were feasible for adoption just on their international intelligibility. And also for Esperanto applies that the more international a word is, the more fit it seems to adoption. We met already the same kind of problem in the uh, lecture we heard about uh, Slavic uh, languages. Um, the first grammar and vocabulary were edited by Zamenhof in English, French, German, Polish, and Russian. Apart from Polish, those are the main source languages for Esperanto. To who should be added still? Italian and Latin. At the end of the 19th century, just these six living languages constituted in European eyes the civilized world. Zamenhof wisely incorporated into the Esperanto grammar a very famous rule, the 15th uh, rule of the Esperanto grammar, which at all consists of 16 rules. And that 15th rule, rule says this, the so called foreign words, that is, words which the greater number of languages have derived from the same source. And there go no change in the international language beyond conforming to its system of orthography. So um, 
the foreign word must be transferred to <coughs> by the greater number of languages. So what is the greater number of languages? He never was outspoken about this, and people tend uh, to think uh, that he thought only of maybe those six, seven European languages. But because we now are uh, in another era of history, uh, we think differently about the possible meaning of the greater number of languages. Some of us couldn't even imagine, probably, a world in which there are so many um, super uh, central languages, uh, which I mentioned already. Uh, also from outside Europe, uh, 13 supernatural, uh, super central languages, of which five are outside Europe. Um, it would be easy if there would be just one cultural community um, of which most of the languages already borrowed their words, for instance, from Greek and Latin. But um, the other languages which I mentioned already, they constitute a word long center of its own. In the <coughs> um, or, and now comes a very important uh, question, or has the English language, as the main medium of Western culture and science, already played such a unifying role that people from the most diverse cultural backgrounds have a sizable number of international words in common? In order to investigate this question, I made up a sample of 70 fairly recent loan words from English and registered their acceptance or rejection in 54 languages from Asia, Africa, and Europe. Just to give you an impression of the kind of words I took into that sample, I will mention some of them alphabetically. Aerobics, bazooka, bingo, bodybuilding, booby trap, Bulldozer, camcorder, camper, cashew nut, computer, cornflakes, cracker, crypto gun, dinky toy, donut, doping, dressing, etc. So they are all a word from after the Second World War up to 1990. With the help of Google Translate, I noted the 54 translations of those 70 words and checked whether they would be considered as being derived from the original English word. The results of this check constitute for each language a pattern of acceptance <coughs> over those 70 words. Uh, just a, a column of ones and zeros, of course, nothing else. And these patterns can be compared between languages, between the borrowed languages. Then it is possible to calculate the degree of conformity between the borrowing languages. Conformity in the art of accepting a word from English or, of course, rejecting it. The most ready to hand method then to group languages on the basis of this degree of conformity is called average linkage cluster. Each language is grouped with its closest match in borrowing, in borrowing behavior towards English. And later, and later, languages are added to existing groups and groups to groups until all of the languages form one single group. Now, I hope the next picture will Um, because this uh, picture was 
immensely uh, big. I cut it into four parts. <laughs> um, so uh, this is the legend, and there it starts, and there it goes on. And in the next picture, you uh, can follow the rest of the tree. It's like a genealogical tree. Um, but there is no forefather. <laughs> you have just to study it from um, down outside. Um, and what is the most surprising is that um, the proximity of languages does not follow closely uh, the pattern of language groups, uh, Germanic, um, Romanic, Slavic, and so on. Partly, but not closely. Um, Okay. Fine. For instance, Greek and Hungarian have 72% proximity. If that's, can you read it? I don't know. I doubt it. Um, I can't read it. Oh, yeah, the bottom line. Right, lower left. Here, yes. Have 72% <coughs> conformity in borrowing and rejecting English words. Um, which may be rather surprising. Turkish finds itself in the midst of Romanic languages. Swahili and Maltese are in the midst of Germanic languages. Maybe I have to go to the next. Uh, Germanic language must be over there or down here. Must be Swahili. Yes, up there. Swahili oh, and Japanese. Mm -hmm. So they be they are uh, behave in relation to English uh, very much like uh, Germanic languages. Um, Romanic languages are not so close to each other in borrowing pattern as one would think. Italian, Romanian, and French behave differently from the Iberian language group. Iberian, so that's uh, Spanish, and Galician, and Portuguese. Uh, have Tagalog. Must be down there at the end. Yes. Down there. Uh, the names of the languages are in Esperanto, so, but uh, you will recognize them. I have Tagalog, the language um, spoken on the Philippines, and Korean, something in common, it seems so, is Azerbaijan close to Malayan and Indonesian because of their Islamic strain, and at the very uh, right Corner. Clearly, Mandarin and Arabic find each other in a common pattern of rejection of English words. <coughs> this tree is not very revealing, though. The main finding is that languages in general do not position themselves to 20th, 20th century English words accurately according to their language family. So, um, instead of uh, sticking to the idea of those uh, language families, I, um, out of this uh, statistic material, I um, composed those groups which have borrowed their names from language families, but what, which are not exactly language families, because the Germanic language group also um, comprises Japanese, uh, Maltese, uh, and Swahili. And the criterion for saying that is a group is just by comparing the average uh, conformity inside the group of those Germanic uh, languages with the average uh, conformity of the group as a whole to the outside languages. 
Um, and then it is interesting that there is a group uh, of foreign languages. And what do they have in common? I think it's just they were formerly British colonies. Uh, and they also um, have a rather high pattern of uh, borrowing words from English. Um, and now we may look at those colors. Uh, the purple is the average percentage borrowed out of 70 English words. Uh, so it's clear the Germanic language group borrows the highest percentage. Um, but what is also important is the red uh, color, because that is the average internal conformity. So how close are those uh, languages among themselves in relation to English, of course. Um, The Balto-Slavic language group also comprises uh, languages like um, Greek, Hungarian, um, Finnish, and Estonian, which are no Baltic languages. Um, and the non-colonized Afro-Asiatic group is um, the group of um, uh, Hindi um, and uh, Arabic and um, Chinese. Or, I don't know. Um, Okay, um, my speeches on will be on the internet, so <laughs> if you are interested in the exact composition of those groups, uh, of course you will be able to find it. Um, but now, the result uh, of this analysis is rather disappointing. disappointing. Um, because it's clear that those groups um, have not enough in common uh, um, with regards to borrowing pattern that you can expect easily to have a majority of languages who took some word from English, or could be even from another language, from French, uh, but we um, concentrate now on English. Um, uh, one group, the Germanic group, may massively borrow some words, some word, but then some other group, uh, and especially, of course, the uh, non-colonized Afro-Asiatic group, which comprises also Chinese and Arabic, um, has no affinity whatsoever with uh, such a word. So the problem of applying this rule of Esperanto, of Zamenhof, uh, remains as it was before. Uh, it's difficult to uh, attain a majority of um, languages which took some word uh, from the same source. Um, but I think I found some compromise to this problem. Um, at first, one should never think of the majority of languages being the majority of those 6,000 languages the world knows. Uh, that's ridiculous. Uh, and you know, I, I explained already that Zamano also not thought of 6,000 languages, but probably thought only of those languages uh, French, uh, German, English, Russian, uh, Italian, and Latin. Um, I advocate the view that the Conglang, which aspires to be spoken all over the world, must accept that only the educated are prone to get interested in the special community which supports this Conglang. 
there are no peripheral languages in which you can follow a study at university. In bilingual countries with one European language, definitely most of the universities offer courses only in that European language. Think of South Africa with 12 official languages, India with 26, and all other colonies, whether speaking French, Spanish, or Portuguese. A sensible interpretation of the rule of Zamenhof can only be like the so-called foreign words, that is words which the greater number of languages weighed according to each number of entrants at academic courses, have derived from the same source, etc. So the importance of a language is weighed uh, after the number of students at university. I don't want to discuss about the opportunity, about the opportunity of this, just this criterion, and because you can also say uh, take all students at uh, uh, second level. No, I took all students at third level. Why? Because I could find it in internet. <laughs> It is readily available from UNESCO sources. And now I try to um, calculate from those sources uh, which number of uh, university students exist. And then you see English, Mandarin, which is Chinese, Spanish, Russian, Hindi, Arabic, etc. I may ask real quick, is this first language? Is that no, it's, uh, uh, no, uh, often, often not, because they may speak an, another uh, uh, native language, okay, so but they have to accept uh, to study, take a service in another language. Okay, I understand. Uh, so this goes on to um, languages which have only uh, 100 uh, students in that language at that university as a teaching language, of course. But I took only those, and that I think it's rather interesting to know that. Um, We are ready now to test the internationality of words in Interlingua, Ido, or Esperanto on the basis of my interpretation of the Zamenhofian criterion. I did so with 95 words, and which sample did I take? They were listed as not recommended on a website of La Bona Lingua, which means the righteous language, the good language, or, but I, it has the connotation of the, the righteous language. This site is administered by a group of Esperantists who are eager to stress the need for Esperanto words being simple. They generally do not accept long words if a schematic synonym, that is a word composed of two or more primitives, is available. Primitive is, is that a common word in English? Uh, it's a, I'm not sure it means semantic. Uh, a, a root. Yeah. Root word. Yeah. So that, they, yeah. Um, however, all of these words were either declared official by the Esperanto Academy or were in use by Zamenhof himself, the initiator of Esperanto. And so I just uh, compared two um, schools in Esperanto, uh, the liberal school, uh, and only words already, already have been accepted in Esperanto officially, whatever this officiality may mean, or which were used by Jan. And uh, at the other side, the righteous um, uh, Esperantists who say, um, this word should not have been declared officially official. 
are Danelon should not have used it because it's not as an international event. It turned out that 39 words out of those 95 were deemed to be understood by more than half of the world's student po population and as such should be a natural part of Esperanto, according to by me, by this uh, technique. And you find them here. Uh, they may, um, yeah, I, some are a bit strange because, for instance, the word villo does not, uh, it's not being used at all uh, nowadays, but it's the old form. Now in Esperanto, you say villao. Ameno is just the Esperanto equivalent of amen. But um, they were. They have been um, outlawed, so to say, by the people of that website. And of course, often there are sensible reasons for it. Um, if you um, are in favor of schematic words, uh, for instance, anti-Semita, I don't like to use it as an Esperantist, right, because the uh, how do you say the the, uh, the anti? It, it's not an Esperanto word. Um, okay, and now I'll show to you the whole graphic of all those words, and they go here from Ameno Villo uh, until the end. Uh, the first words are the international words, and here the uh, number of students at the university level dropped down under half of the total. And so, according to my interpretation of the Sun and Hoff rule, uh, uh, those words um, should uh, not be accepted in this form. Um, and finally, here are the other words um, which uh, are not um, sufficiently international. Orange, uh, orange. You understand that? Yeah. Orangerie. Orangerie. See, that's why it's a bad international word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's, um, yeah, I have to say that. Uh, Orangerie. Oh, or Georgia. <laughs> uh, but what do you say? No good word in English, but I think orange orchard. Yeah. Orchard. Yes. Uh, orchard. But or uh, orange. Yes. Of yes. orange, orange trees. <laughs> yeah. And, um, it's not recommended words. Yeah. Um, um, uh, they are not recommended, yes. Oh, okay. And of course, on that same website, uh, uh, is uh, offered, is recommended, an, an alternative. Right? You never can say the word in its own is not recommended, at least if you say there should be not too many synonyms. If you uh, favored the uh, interlingua uh, philosophy, and uh, that everything which is uh, understood by an intellectual you may accept maybe all of them. Definitely not all of them, because at the last rows you see uh, words I never think of. <laughs>